Welcome to Tales from the Pit, the behind the lens access for the entertainment world and the creative people involved. Today, we have a director slash camera operator. He's got a lot of great projects. Uh, he's worked on Avengers uh, Age of Ultron. He's worked on Top Gun Maverick. He's worked on Salem's Lot, the new show, uh, and many, many, many more things. BJ McDonald, thank you for joining us. It's awesome to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Super cool. Uh, we usually like to start with maybe your origin story, if you will, how you got started, what were your influences uh, in the younger years growing up and led you in your direction? You know, it all, it all started with my grandfather because he was an actor. Uh, and, you know, as, as a kid growing up, he would take me and my sister to uh, old Tucson where he had his show High Chaparral. And um, it's crazy because, you know, it was just funny because he was just granddad. You know, he was our grandfather. We never... We, it, it was just kind of like everybody's grandparents like worked at an office or a lawyer or whatever, you know, fisherman, whatever. But our grandfather was always on TV. So it was kind of crazy. So it was kind of neat growing up in that world and seeing that there was that kind of a career path that you could have. Cause a lot of people don't understand that you could do a creative careers like acting or being a crew person or things like that. And it kind of at a young age, it got me inspired. So me and my buddies would always make these like terrible action films and horror films with VHS cameras and things, you know, and I just got the bug and, I was always like just wanting to like where some people would want to go ride their BMX bike, which I would too. But at the same time, it's like, I, uh, I was like, Oh no, come on guys. We got the camcorder. Let's go make a cool movie, man. We've got like this boat. We can go sink it. Or we got some fireworks. We can blow up these GI Joes and we can make explosions. And my whole goal was just having fun and trying to make movies and like the whole editing creative process, like figuring out how to, how that worked. And it, it really spawned for my grandfather showing interest and in, like, like understanding you could do, film work and that's where it really came from and just my love of movies you know growing up as an 80s kid when hbo first came out and you know i just opened up the world of a lot of movies and things that i kind of like really dug like introduced me to like john carpenter you know uh sam raimi's and and you know wes craven and, and just like all, steven spielberg you know just things that like directors and the movies and the way they made me feel it just became a really like passionate thing for me and that's honestly kind of the things that really spawned it all. When, when, were you able to go on set with your grandfather and see the behind the scenes stuff? You know, I went to old Tucson where his show was. And at that time, his show was already pretty much done filming. But because okay. of his show, when he'd go there, people were like, oh, hey, what's going on, Big John? That was his name and High Chaparral. And, you know, I was like, well, what's, this is weird. And then, like, I, you know, as a kid, I'd run around with little, little, like, cowboy guns and stuff like that. And, you know, then I'd watch the show and it was just kind of cool. And I went to a couple things where he did commercials, nothing like movie wise, but like he used to do Toyota commercials in Pensacola, Florida, where I grew up, uh, just helping out like kind of like the, the yep. city, you know, the, the, the local Toyota dealership. And he would do these like commercials there. So I'd see him do that stuff. But, you know, it was more my grand after he had passed away, my grandmother really kind of like was the one that really pushed me and, and kept telling me, hey, look, you know, me and your grandfather did this. This is something you could do also. So don't think you can't, you know, you know, don't think you have to go be a fireman or a doctor or anything like that. You can do whatever you want to do. And if this is your passion or interest, you pursue it. You, you know, that's amazing because you, you think back, back to that time, you know, we're both from the same time period. For, and uh, you think back to that time and back in the day, people would hitchhike out to California to do that sort of thing. They never had any internal influence saying, yeah, you can do this. Everyone's like, I'm going to do this. I don't care what you say. And I'm going to go hitchhike across the country to do it. <laughs> it's a, well, I, and that's the thing. It's like, I, what I, what I always find in most people that work in this business I and mean, which you know, other careers too and everything, but there's a real passion for being, you know, be, working in films because yeah. you want to be a part of this creative process and thing. I think it just drives a lot of people. And then, you know, Again, where a lot of people that like, or a lot of my friends that I grew up with, like 
you know, they're like, well, I don't know how you can do that because you're your freelance and you're your own boss. And it's like, well, yeah, that's kind of the cool part of it is that you work on a project when you're done and you look for another project and you don't really have a set boss. You're not going to a cubicle every day. You're not sitting next to, you know, Joe Smith for 30 years until he retires. And, you know, it's like you're always around new people and things like that, which I think is amazing. So, you know, there's a big passion for it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, the, what was, what, was there any educational process for that in the younger days or was it just you kind of just playing around uh, and then working, getting in the industry or did you go through a, a, you know, a schooling process or anything? I did. I, well, I didn't know how to start, you know, cause my grandfather was already long gone. So I just was like, well, I guess I got to go to film school. That's how you do it. So yeah. after I, you know, I was in a punk band for a long time and I wanted to be more of a punk rocker kind of like that was the career path I wanted, but Unfortunately, we weren't that great, so I had to <laughs> go find a job. I've been there, um, I know. <laughs> yeah, and so so then I moved to L.A., and I just was like, all right, I guess I'm going to hit film school. But I can't, you know, I found out through friends that I had met and how I got more into it was the fact that it's like you really don't have to go to a film school. It's more about if you're going to do a job on a set, like being a, a, a crew person, it's more about just getting the experience and meeting people. It's all about contacts and things like that and learning set etiquette and learning how things work. And it kind of opens your eyes to like, you know, I started here at this level, but then I saw this cool, this, this job over here. So I want to try that. And you meet those people and they bring you in and you can just keep going up and up if you want to, you know, just yeah. doing it that way. And that's kind of how you do it. I think film school personally, it's if you're, unless you're producing or editing or learning some kind of a thing like that, uh, I don't find it, as important to spend a lot of money to go to a film school because it's really more important about learning on set, you know, what's going on on sets and like how, and like what the, what the jobs are and things like that. So that's my, that's my advice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just, just go do it. Right. And you'll save yeah. a lot of money. Take the money you're going to actually spend on, on school and make a short film. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a filmmaker myself. I do a, a lot of corporate related stuff, but I also do my own passion projects, probably similar to you, I assume. And uh, yeah. a lot of that, I mean, honestly, it's like, it's problem solving through the whole thing. It's like, all right, how am I going to do this for, for no money or for very little? How am I going to get people involved? How am I going to yeah. shoot this thing? You know, all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, sorry, no matter sorry. how, I'm just saying, no matter what size a budget of a movie is, it can be the lowest budget, it can be no budget to the biggest budget, just even that, you're always having to problem solve something. There's always something that's thrown, a curveball is always thrown your way every single day, which is kind of awesome because, you know, it keeps your mind going, keeps you kind of fresh and, and makes you think about it. So when jumping back to the band stuff, were you the guitar player, singer, drummer? What was your process? <laughs> I was a bass player, you oh, know, nice. and yep. uh, yeah, because it was the easiest instrument to play. So, and I suck at being a musician. So uh, that was the, that was the one thing I could pick up and learn. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny as I, you know, being a musician and a filmmaker myself, I kind of, there's a correlation between the creativity of that. And I, I, with most people I've been talking to doing this podcast, it's like a lot of people were a musician first. And mm -hmm. then kind of transitioned out of that into, you know, a photographer or, or a filmmaker, yeah. or whatever it is. So there's definitely that root there in the creativity of the music part, I think. Yeah. You know, I, it's funny because I, I used to love and like, I love playing in front of people. I love the energy. I love the way it made me feel like it was almost like an addictive drug. It's like, I just wanted to do it all the time because there was just that cool energy of being on stage. And like, it was a nervous feeling, but it was a, you know, and, and you never knew like whatever show or whatever town you were in, it could either be like the best experience or it could be like the most crushing experience, depending on what crowds you're playing for. If the people are really liking your music, or like, I mean, I remember being on tour and like, we'd be, we get booked at these places that no one wanted to hear punk rock. They wanted to hear like Nickelback and we'd end up playing and we'd be like, boo, you know, people throwing stuff fast. Like, okay, thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. We take off. It's just kind of funny. So, but the good times, it's very, it's like a drug. It's like, seriously, it's like, it is addictive. You just want to keep playing shows and, and, and watching people enjoy what you're doing and creating. And, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed that, knowing that what we're doing was actually making people happy at the places that actually were great like that, like the, the punk venues or the metal venues or places like that, where that's where they yeah. wanted to see stuff. It was, it was great. You know, I, I, I love doing that. The, uh, and it you have, you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but you have a lot of musical connections with your filmmaking. How, how does, how does, was, was that a natural connection or was that just you being in the right place at the right time? How did you, how did you start with the music video or, or you know, that sort of stuff? 
The Slayer stuff that just kind of came, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I've always been a fan of the band and, and they were, I had directed a movie called Hatchet 3, like a while yeah. back. And, and Slayer was looking for the new album. They were basically looking for a horror director. And so I ended up going and actually interviewing at Nuclear Blast. You know, I, they interviewed a bunch of different people. And I did, I actually went in there with nothing. I didn't have a pitch. I had nothing. I just got the phone call and they're like, well, can you come in and talk to us? Like, sure. So I went in there and I just told them, you know, it's like, and it wasn't even Slayer, it was Gerardo and the, and the, the label guys. And, the, and I was just like, you know, I said, I said, you know, MTV is not a thing anymore. It's really, it's, it's more about YouTube. And, and I said, my whole thing with Slayer was the fact that, that, uh, they never made a video that said Slayer to me. And, and so I said, let me, let me write a pitch. And so I went home, wrote two pitches and I made something very like what I feel is a Slayer video what what I wanted kind of out of the music. And then they went for it, you know, which is, which is crazy. That's kind of how it happens. Um, you know, my, I guess my pitch was better than some of the other ones. I don't know, but they went for mine cause it was super gnarly. Uh, uh, and you know, that just kind of went on with that. And I don't, it's funny cause the music thing, it's just, I go, I do go see a lot of shows. I see a lot of bands and a lot of people that I know that are not only just, you know, musicians, but there's producers that are in here. They're in, you know, sound engineers, they're people like that. You know, you kind of get to know them and, trails off to someone knowing this person or someone knowing right. that person. Yeah. And that's kind of how it got, you know, how it all kind of comes about again, going back to contacts and people that, you know, that's really what it boils down to is, is the people you meet. This is a big business for those who want to get into this business. As you should know, it's really, it's, it's skill a little bit, but it's, it's honestly the people that you know and the people you surround yourself with. Yep. And, and how you you know, how you relate yourselves to everyone and your work ethics and all that stuff too. definitely goes a long way. Did, it does. What, when, when it comes, when it came to that Slayer video was, was there things off limits to you or were you like, you know what, I'm just going to throw as crazy or, or, or I was like, no, that's not really what I want. That's, I don't think they'll go for that. Was, did you have any sort of, you know, lines that you didn't want to cross or anything? I didn't really have, it's like, I guess more of the lines that I didn't cross was more budgetary. <laughs> Yeah, because sure. when you, I just would ask like, well, what's the budget for this thing? And so I, you know, and that's not really crossing lines. That's just kind of being cognizant of like what your parameters are of writing a pitch. Yep. Um, and I did write one huge budget kind of style one that was like super gnarly. It was very cannibalistic graphic, kind of like bikers in the desert, kind of crazy stuff. And Carrie King loved that one, but there was just no way we were going to afford to do that. And then the, and then I did the prison one that was more contained and that's where it, that all kind of came off of. You know, so I wasn't really, I just kind of just started writing, you know, and like, that was it. It wasn't really anything where I felt like, you know, I had any kind of constraints or anything that, you know, that there's certain things that I won't do, that I won't do that I just don't like, you know, but, you know, I'm very much into horror and I'm very much into like, you know, graphic, like blood, guts, fights, guns, you know, that kind of stuff. I love that. I love action. I love horror. So that was kind of like what I really wanted to do. Yep. Yep. Let, let's, let's go back a little bit. Cause I kind of jumped ahead, but what was, what was sure. the first big project you worked on? What, uh, and what was your involvement in that project? Oh, well, that just depends on, are you talking about whenever I was a grip or are you talking about when I became a camera operator or well, let's, let's start? Yeah. So you started off as a grip basically, yeah. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. how, so uh, explain what a grip is first. So anyone watching who may not know, to me, I always say the grips are the Navy SEALs of the film uh, business because they're the guys that handle everything. They're the guys that problem solve. They're the guys that build things. They're the, you know, they're the, they're the guys that push the dollies and work with the camera. Um, they're the guys that shape you know, the lights and cut the lights. They're, they're rigging. They're, you know, I mean, let me tell you, they're like, they're like the most creative and awesome guys on set. You know? And that was, for, that's how I got in was just because you know a buddy of mine was a grip and he's like come learn this skill and it taught me not only film stuff but also taught me stuff at home like I didn't know half the like things or how to build stuff or anything like that until I actually became a grip because that taught me a lot of great life lessons um and so oh god what is the first thing like one of the first big things as a grip I would say Terminator 3 maybe oh really okay yeah that's a huge one that, that might have been like like the biggest movie that I was on. I started out when I was gripping, I was doing more television. And so I did a show okay. called Fast Lane that was like created by Mick G. You know, it only last one oh, yeah. season. So we could, yeah, so it was like Tiffany Thiessen and Peter Fascinelli. 
um, it, it was it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was we, about a bunch of cops that 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 never took anybody in. <laughs> they basically so, they usually just killed the guy. <laughs> okay, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? <laughs> They're bad guys, right? You that's right. Go. So you're doing gripping. I mean, that's probably a really good entry into the business if you don't have any technical trade, uh, any skill set of anything, because you're kind of involved with everything as a grip, everything yeah. from helping set up the camera if possible to building your set to helping with lighting, everything. Yeah, I think it's a great entryway in, you know, and like, and it does, it, it, it's a quick way to teach you a lot about like a lot of things. Like I right. said, like tying, tying knots, like learning all the different kinds of knots you tie, you know, like, like, like setting, like doing rigging and properly doing it. So it's safe, you know, like you really, there's a lot of things that, that, that world to me teaches you. And I've told so many people, it's like, you know, if you want to get started, that's such a great spot because, and also like having Navy SEALs, you always need a bunch of different guys, you know, cause like as a camera operator for me, it's like me and like, usually like a, a, another operator, it's like two of us and we get picked yeah. and there's only two people where as if you're a grip, they need a bunch of guys, you know, they need a, they need a, they need a crew. So you're always going to be getting work and you're going to be able to work. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a great start and you make good money once you get going and getting in the unions and things like that. I was yeah. very happy with it, but nice. you know, I needed, for me, I always felt like I needed to keep going and do more. So for that first project, that, that's probably a pretty huge project, Terminator 3. Uh, uh, was, were you, uh, you know, you know, were you like, overwhelmed with that because that's you know you're working with art schwarzenegger when he was sort of at his peak and stuff like that um, and was that was that a overwhelming project for you or was it you know th- i'm kind of used to this sort of thing by now at that point in time it was very exciting not so much overwhelming it was more of like you know it, there's times where you would be kind of nervous about things but you just right. kind of like for me i was like well just get in there and just own it you know like just you, you're like oh i know how to do that and i'm like oh shit what am i doing like you know you're trying to <laughs> try to watch the other guys and kind of learn off what they're doing yep. sometimes like the, the more seasoned grips and things like that. So, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a bit of, there's a level of intimidation. I mean, here's the thing. I think there's always a level of intimidation or things that like when you're going to any kind of movie set and even to this day, there's things where I get on there and I go, Oh man, what are we doing? Oh, I've never done that before. You know, cause there's yeah. things that pop up. It never really becomes a thing where I feel like I'm just like, you know, I'm like autopiloting through, you know, right. it, and, and I like the challenge. And so it's, you know, it, it was intimidating. It's intimidating, but you just got to go in and own it and just, you know, yep. get through it. The, the transition from grip to camera. So now that you jump to camera, you have to have specific knowledge of stuff. Did you, were you learning that through grip or did you have to physically go take some courses or anything like that? So, as I was a grip, I started doing dolly grip, gr- okay. dolly grip work. So now I'm working hand in hand with the operator. So gotcha. I'm pushing the dolly, I'm booming the camera up and down. I'm doing the moves of them, hitting my marks um, and learning framing just by like using a monitor and watching him. So I got really excited about that. And I was like, well, this is kind of cool because as a grip, after a couple, you know, after a little while, I felt like everything that I was working on, if I'd go see a movie, I never saw something that I had my finger on the pulse or a touch to it. I just know I worked on it. Um, or as a camera operator, it's, I'm the one that's shooting the whole movie, you know, me and the other operator and, and right. the camera crew, you know, but I'm physically moving the camera, I'm doing the moves and that stuff. So that became, and after doing the dolly grip stuff, I really started enjoying seeing what I was doing as a dolly grip on, on movies or TV shows of just the movement we were doing. So I got kind of like, all right, I can do that. So I ended up doing a steady cam course. Um, and because I was really interested in that also of, of being a steady cam operator. And so I took a course um, and I fell in love with it. And then I basically borrowed money from my grandmother, you know, and was like trying to, you know, she, she gave me a loan I had to pay back and I went and worked as hard as I could as a mm-hmm. grip to buy piece by piece by piece, a bunch of, you know, really expensive gear for, for that. Yep. Finally, after about two years of doing grip work and putting this thing together and paying my grandmother back, I had, I had a full rig. So then I started working on student films where I knew I could mess up or like, you know, and I thought it sounds terrible for any students that are watching this. That they're like, well, I'm not going to hire a guy. Now he's saying that, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you got to get your chops somewhere. So yeah. I was like, in my head, I was like, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go like just give my services to students. Um, so I can build a reel. And, and if I do make a mistake, it's not a damning mistake that like some, you know, like Universal or MGM, I mean, or, you know, Warner Brothers or, or some studio is going to get, you know, my name's going to get blacklisted. Right. 
So that's, that's kind of the, how I, how I did it. I, I went through and I would make my mistakes and I would, you know, I also built, you know, great relations with people from like AFI and UCLA and USC and, and schools later on down the line that I would end up working with, you know, when everybody's career started taking off. So that's kind of how I got into being a camera operator by doing it that way. And then as a grip, I had met DPs and I would just say, Hey guys, you know, I'm, I've been doing steady cam for a while now. And I know if your regular guy isn't there and he can't do it, you know, I would love to, you know, give me a shot, give me a chance. And some people did. Yep. And that's really the transition of how I became from a grip to a camera operator, or steady cam operator, you yeah. know, and it was great knowing the DEPs as a grip, learning my skills as a steady cam operator and a camera operator, because it you have to know both. And then going back to those DEPs and just being like, give me a chance, guys. And, you know, it, I got lucky. Yeah, that's, I mean, well, I mean, it's a lot of it is you just, you know, doing your work and being ready. And, the you know, when the opportunity strikes, you're either ready or you're not. And you're, you know, you jump into it. The, yeah. The difference between camera and steady cam, just for people watching, steady cam is a generally could be a, 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 a mounted uh, camera to you that you're walking around balancing and holding it in for those movement shots. You're maybe running alongside somebody or something like that. Um, the shining. Watch the shining. Right, right. Yeah, I, uh, steady I, cam. I do a lot. I have the, the Ronin S and mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of steady cam work with that. Um, I'm actually looking at the new uh ronin 4 4d oh yeah that. that looks pretty sweet yeah oh yeah <laughs> um, so yeah so anyway so now you're now you're into the camera stuff and you're doing some cool stuff are you doing are you starting off like doing b-roll are you the you know uh, the main camera operator for a lot of projects or how does that work for your process for in the early days so in the early days, it would be they would I would get hired usually just to come in as the steady cam guy, which they don't okay. do that much anymore. And I kind of, you know, back back in the day, like I'm sounding like I'm like old, when I am old. Um, but back in the day, some films or TV shows would just hire steady cam guy. So for the TV show, that TV show Heroes, I used to be just their steady cam guy. So there'd be times where I would just get a call and they'd be like, "Hey, can you be here like these three days this next week?" Yeah, of course. Sometimes I'd be there for an hour and I'd do one shot and they'd send me home and. The great thing about those things, it's like you get paid a full day, you get your full rental, and sometimes you get totally destroyed too. But oh, yeah. I, I was the steady cam guy for a while. And then, you know, I I would start getting projects where they're like, well, we need you to stay here to be the B camera guy, or we need you to stay here and shoot some inserts. Or we, you know, and so then now I'm doing, you know, traditional operating and and learning more about that stuff. And uh that's that's kind of like the transition of how I went. I would start like with B camera or like a second unit or something like that. And, gotcha. and I would, uh, I would learn it that way. And then it just, it evolves after a while and people start to get a chance or you take your chance and say, no, I want to be the A camera operator, you know, and be the main guy. And yeah. it just, it's just like progression with anything. You just make your way, work your way the top, up, up the ladder. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at you. I mean, you have so many projects you've been on. I mean, tons of tons of stuff <laughs> you've been at this for a long time. So you have a lot of experience, a lot of history with, a lot of different uh, you know, you know, films and uh, you know people and all that stuff. Um, I got started pretty young. That well, that's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. Unfortunately for me, I started way late. I was I was always an audio guy. I mean, I had a similar path as you. I was the musician and then kind of transitioning <laughs> over. I was the audio guy for the boom mic operator for a long time. And then I was like, I'm sick of holding oh, yeah. this stupid thing up all day long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I started exactly. watching all the camera operators. I was like, you know what? I think that's where I want to go. I, I and same just like you, I went out and started getting collecting my equipment and starting my own thing on the side. You know, yeah, exactly. from there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, um, I, I kind of skipped over and I want to talk more about this later, but I kind of, I, I meant to mention this at the beginning. You, you, uh, you just finished, or I shouldn't say you just finished, you, you put out one of my favorite movies so far of this year, which was the Foo Fighters movie, uh, Studio 666. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that was this year Thank or last year. I forget what, what the actual release this time year. was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorites so far. That, I mean, that's just crazy. <laughs> I want to talk more about that later, but I, I was going to mention sure. that at the beginning, but I completely forgot it. So people watching, we're going to talk about that too. <laughs> the, um, Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, you do. Uh, I mean, you've got so much stuff. And I, um, on, I believe you started working with uh, Jack Reacher. So you've worked with Tom Cruise previous mm -hmm. as the camera operator, right? Uh, yeah. And you've worked on several big projects and a wide variety of TV shows and different things like that. Um, 
uh, and, and the Marvel stuff, Ant Man, uh, Age of uh, Ultron for Avengers, and, and Shazam, and stuff like that for DC. Um, was there when when you're going through these? I mean, some of these projects, I'm I'm assuming, are just monstrous projects, and other ones are probably very small, you know, close, uh, very tight team and stuff like that. Did you? Um, did you? Is is there like a different process for you when you're on a major pro, major project versus one of those little tight small pro, projects or anything like that for you in, in regards to what you do? It's just the planning. It's you know when you're getting on these projects, it's like you you, you know talking to the director of photography and like learning like what are we doing, what kind of gear are we going to get, like what kind of shots are we doing, and getting like pre-bizes or you know just getting the script and talking about the style they want to do. And that's kind of like how I kind of you know, prepare myself for those things. Because once you start knowing the gear, you kind of know what you're getting into, you know, and, and you just, you also got to think of like, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, they, they want to do this shot. How am I going to do this shot? How am I going to accomplish what the, you know, the director or the DP want to do? Or even when I'm directing, it's like, how am I going to accomplish this shot? You got to kind of troubleshoot things and come up with it on the fly, you know, or you plan it out like, you know, during pre-pro. Um, or even the beginning of a job, someone will say, oh, yeah, we have this one shot in a couple of weeks. Well, how are we going to do that? And usually it's, we're sitting over dinner talking about it and just, you know, oh, yeah, what if we try this? What if we try right. that? You know, this is, it just depends on, like, you know, how much prep you have, how much time you have, how much the budget's going on. You know, it's like because some of those big movies, they're already planned out. Like, right. you know, like like most of, a lot of the Marvel things, you, you know, you roll into those things and, and you get a, you get an iPad and you get a pre biz of certain action of action moments. It's basically a cartoon. You want your cartoon of what we're going to do, yeah. which actually you go, okay, I see this one shot. How are we going to do that? And then you have to figure out how to do that. So it's kind of fun when you have those, but it's also like, it's also fun when you don't have a pre biz and you go and you just kind of think about it and then you just make up the concepts and you go about doing it. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to do it. It just depends on time how much time they've prepped and how much time you've prepped, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I wonder on some of those, I mean, obviously for some of those huger projects, everything's well planned in advance, like, as you said, and stuff like that, when it comes to the visual camera angles and stuff like that, are you basically just mimicking what's there or are you, are you kind of getting a little creative with your angles or is that project to project? It's project to project. And it's also like, I mean, sometimes you'll see a shot and you're like, okay, well, that's cool that I see this on here, but look at the space we're in. It's like, right. <laughs> well, how, you know, so basically if I was to try to mimic this shot, I'd have to like remove this wall to get the camera in this one spot. You know, then you have to kind of come up with ideas and ways to move people around to get things to fix. Yeah. You know, it's all, again, going back to the problem solving of it all, like you have to, it's all problem solving at that point in time, like in trying to like work it out. You know, you know, with the constraints that you have, or like what this, what the whole set pieces are. You and know, how soon, how how uh, how early are you involved with the project? Or is is it generally the projects are already defined, and now they just bring in the crew and, and camera and all that stuff? Or are you like at the early stages with the writing process, or or even the uh, pre process stuff? Or is it different from project oh, yeah. to project? It's usually it's it's kind of the same. It's usually like when I'm camera operating, it's just hey, we got this movie coming up, and we're gonna be shooting in a couple of weeks. You want to do it? Sure. Okay, great. You don't hear anything, and then your agent talks to people, and the next thing you know, you're getting a script, and you read the script, and then you don't hear anything. And because <laughs> usually the DP and the director are out, the ones they're the ones that are like kind of like going around and and coming up with the ideas, and then. I'll get a call or we'll again go over dinner or something, or, you know, then we'll talk about what we're planning on doing or the week ahead or whatever, you know, or I'll get a, or I'll get a list of like, you know, basically the day of days and, and, and kind of like a shoot schedule and I'll start seeing like, after I've read the script, go, oh, okay, that's when we're going to do this, that. And then maybe I have questions. It really just, it depends on who's prepping, who's, who's doing what. I mean, sometimes you don't know what you're getting into. You know, I've had yeah. DP, but they don't tell me anything. And then they're like, well, we're going to do this. I'm like, well, it'd been nice to know we could <laughs> yeah. have had the right stuff. But yeah. then you have DPs that are so on top of it that they say, oh, well, today we got this piece of gear because we're going to do this and that. And you're like, thank God. All right, great. It's easy. Now you, you got the right stuff. <laughs> the, makes it uh, faster. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, it really depends on the communication of, uh, of, of the people involved making the decisions. I, <laughs> I'm aware yeah. of that. That's for sure. The, oh, um, yeah. Uh, and so uh, I assume you're, you know, for, for a lot of those projects, you're just hired to come shoot it. You come shoot it for whatever that time period is. And then you probably don't see anything or hear anything for, you know, a year or so or something like that. 
Uh, yeah, you walk away and then you're then you're excited when you see a trailer pop up or right. you know or other times you get the call for like additional photography or whatever is going to happen because if you got a project that's a good budget or whatever usually that you shoot the movie they watch it and then they go all right well this worked or this didn't work and now we're right. going to do reshoots and so next thing you know you're getting the call to go do more stuff <laughs> and, and, and you you had just mentioned that you're heading back out to do some reshoots for salem's lot right the show the tv show yeah additional photography yeah, yeah oh, is that what it is yep yeah, yeah. So we're yeah. Just, yeah, we're just tightening it up, tightening it up. I'm sure, but it's yeah. like that movie's going to be rad. I, I'm excited about this one. That, uh, yeah, that's that looks really cool. I, I'm super psyched about that as well. Um, uh, obviously, I and well, obviously, I'm in Portland, Maine, which is you know Stephen King from Maine, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So, so always, I, I worked on a project called uh, "You Can't Kill Stephen King." It was a, it's a low or independent film that we shot back in. 2015 maybe even earlier i forget what it was uh, yeah <laughs> that was that was kind of a crazy time but it was a lot of fun that's awesome that. yeah yeah it's, it's a lot of fun the um uh uh so 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 you you've uh doing a lot of camera work you're doing a lot of uh involvement stuff i i assume that you you're at a level where you don't sweat it so much anymore because you've been doing this for so long but you probably don't hear about projects until it's pretty close to doing them. So you could possibly go for a period of time without hearing stuff or about, you know, when's the, you know, COVID happens and when's my next project. Is that something that probably isn't as much of a thing anymore, but was that ever a concern in the past or anything like that? You mean just time in between jobs and like, yeah, you, sure. It's still in my, it's always in my head, you know, sure. and it, 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 even, even now it's like, you know, I usually know I'll, I'll get a phone call or something like that, but I always, I always go, you know, my, my last day on set could always be my last day ever on a set. You never know. Cause that's just the way this business is. You know, yeah. that's, that's the scary thing about it is that, you know, it, you, I, I'm always, I'm always super happy whenever I get a job or get a call and it's like, okay, cool, here we go. You know, it's like, I got a, I got this long of a job and then, thing I love about what we do also is the fact that you can have time off if you need it, you know, and I, I kind of trip out like when I'm not working. Cause I really like, I love work. I love my job. Um, and, um, but there's great times where it's like, okay, well, I'm off for like a couple of weeks and then you can kind of figure out what you want to do. Even if it's just sitting on the couch playing video games or, <laughs> or, or writing or things like that, finding time, you know, you get, you get enough time to yourself or like the people that you're around you and your family and people, you, know, you can get some of that time, you know, which is nice. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you have that luxury to take some time off, go for it. Absolutely, help you refresh and recuperate and work on some skills or whatever it is you want to do. Definitely, the 100%. Uh, yeah, the the um, the hatchet. Now, it, um, was that something that you were part of the writing process for? For not for the first or second one, because um, I was the camera operator on the first and second okay. one, third one. I had input into what I was trying to do. Yep. Um, but with that one, I kind of had to follow suit with like what the other ones were. I wanted more, the one that I was directing, I wanted to make it more serious, but okay. at the same time, it was more of a thing where uh, I know that they wanted to keep it the eighties silly, you know, kind of like that kind of vibe. So I had to kind of follow the rules with that. Um, but there's like, like the kills that are in that movie. I was a part of like, I, you know, we brainstormed that stuff about things were going to go. Um, there was a whole storyline that I wanted to do with the movie, but it got shut down because it was, it was really dark and gnarly. Um, <laughs> it was basically like, it was basically like the cop scene in Terminator. Like it was going to be so cool. I wanted that so bad, but oh, you know, when, when you're in there just directing, you're not writing it, you know, usually it's like, people, you know, some people will get more of the, the say so. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I understand. Uh, when it comes to directing now, I, I, I mean, we'll definitely get into the food fire stuff, but what was your directing? So you've done a lot of projects and stuff like that. Did you have a lot of directing um, or have you done a lot of directing prior to when you were doing that in the, in the food fires and whatever else uh, is the, um, what was your directing experience uh, up to that point? Or is that the first one you were really directing, if you will? Hatchet, Hatchet 3 was really the first okay. like main directing thing that I had done. Yep. Um, everything else previous was, was short films I had done in like film school or yeah. like my own little projects. And then, you know, just getting to meet people through being a camera operator and things like that. So Hatchet 3 was kind of like my first 
main thing that I directed. And then it went on to doing the music videos. And I did a couple commercials in between okay. that. Um, and then, you know, the Foo Fighter thing came up after a while. And I think a lot of that had to do with the, the music videos, you yep. know, because Dave's a Slayer fan. The producers that I know were big Slayer fans and we're also friends. And I was a big fan of one of the producers' bands. Uh, so it, it just all kind of worked out that way. So, so what was that process for the beginning stages of working on that? I assume you just have to apply or, you know, go through the same process of every other project. But were the Foo Fighters making the calls on that? Was it record companies? How is, how is that working? So that's the thing. It's like there's a, there's a whole machine that, that works when you're doing a movie like that. Like yeah. you, you do independent films and you do, you know, music videos kind of have your, you have a lot of like play that you can do your own things. But when it comes down to like something like this, there's like, you know, you have management, you have, you know, the, the band themselves, you got to make sure they're happy with what's going on. And then, you know, when, and then once you've done the movie, you could, now you have a studio involved and you got to do these, all these different kind of things. Um, but I mean, really, you know, to start off with that, it was just basically, I got a phone call from, from Jim Rota, the producer um, and him and John Ramsey. And they were like, Hey, Dave wants to do this horror film. And, you know, he knows he did the Slayer videos and things like that. And he, you know, we, we want you to come down and talk to Dave. So they kind of sent me an idea of what Dave wanted to do. Cause he, he came up with the story. And then I kind of went off and did my own, like, I just sat down, wrote a whole pitch thing of what I would add to what he was trying to do. And then I made kind of a lookbook presentation and we just, it's just like any other kind of pitch meeting. We, I, we sat down, we talked about his, what he wanted. And then I said, well, all right. And I passed out all these different like booklets that I had made and said, you know, all right, check this out. I, I think this is cool what you're doing here, but I would add this and I would put these things into this and I would want to do this or that. We talked about directors that we loved and we vibed on that. And I think the fact that both, you know, because he's a musician and I'm also um, was a musician, but now like just a, a big metal, like punk rock fan, we just really bought and that was it, you know? And, and, and then we just, he's like, let's do this. And, you know, with my working in the business for so long, you know, I knew a lot of people that we, we knew we could bring to the table with his music videos that he did. He also worked with uh, makeup effects guys that, that were going to do the show anyways. And they vouched for me. And it was just kind of like, it was, it was like that kind of a world. So it's yeah. just like, it was kind of just a cool meet and greet like at first. And then just kind of showing off like, Hey, you know, you like this director? I love that director. You know, come down to like John Carpenter. Like that was, we, we yeah. really vibed on that because that's kind of who I grew up on. Yeah, I, I <laughs> all the cameos you have in there. I mean, everything is just so awesome. On <laughs> all the different cameos, and uh, were you involved with you know all of the and uh, not the cameos? Were you involved with the like writing of you know you know uh, the deaths and stuff like that, and and you know, all that stuff was 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 this? I don't know if you said was the script completely done, or were you involved with writing on a lot of that? The script was not all done, but the kills were already pre-planned because okay. basically Tony Gardner, who we were bringing in, who also runs Alterian, he, we basically said, Hey, Tony, you know, cause he always, he'll get a script and it'll already have everything pre-planned. He, then he has to figure out how to do it. But this was like, Hey, Tony, what, what would you want to do in a movie? Um, like kill wise that you haven't seen yet that you've always wanted to do. And so he basically wrote down a bunch of different kills that he would like to do. And then we just kind of picked those out and said, all right, this is how so-and-so is going to die. This is how this person's going to die. This is how we're going to like do these things. And it kind of was more fun for him because now he gets to create things that he always wanted to do. And that's kind of how we, how we, it's kind of how we did the kills. That's how we put them all together. The story though, is through the writers and through Dave and, yeah. and, and they, they did that. I only, like there's these shadow people that are in the movie that yep. were never in the script. I, I wrote them and put them in there because I oh, wanted cool. more of a back. I, I just wanted to tell more of a story of this caretaker, this Greg Knoll character. And they talk about him having a band, but in the original script, we never had like any kind of haunting of a band. It was just like the caretaker. You didn't see much of him. I always wanted to add that. And I wanted to do a throwback sort of to the fog. So that's kind of why I modeled the shadow people in studio 666 to kind of look like the pirates in the fog with the, with the red eyes and, and stuff like that. A lot of that is a lot of throwback stuff. Um, I thought, so I wrote I that. that yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It, and then, and then like we had to do a couple different things because of COVID, you know, we started shooting the movie before COVID and then we got shut down when everything shut down and we didn't, we weren't finished making the movie and the whole world shut down. We all went home. And so we had to come back six months later when they were like, all right, we can start working again. And so the, pro, the, the the rules were different. So the ending of, of Studio 666, I had to kind of rewrite because we had to keep kind of people separated from each other, 
you, we had to like social distance people. And so the end of the pool is kind of like everybody's kind of spread out in different spots. And that's why it's because we had to follow these rules. And, you know, there was like a whole free, there's like a whole like dog pile brawl that happened originally in the script. And, you know, I had to take that out and just make it more, which uh, I think it's better now. I, I'm, I'm happier with our ending. Um, I, I think it turned out way cooler and it had a bit more meaning to it. So yeah, I think you know, I, I that's what happens. That. I agree. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I mean, I would have, uh, and, until you told me that, I would have never have guessed that COVID was a factor on how that ending was because I think it's great the way it ends. I like the way everything ties in. I do think that you're invo- the, the shadow people, I think, is actually a really cool idea because it, it adds a whole nother, I mean, because you got the, you know, the, the, the standard, you know, possession stuff going on, but then you get this sort of, you know, uh, other element going on. I think it really adds another level. I thought that was great. I think that was really cool. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I thought too, when we were doing is that I was like, well, we need to add some little more depth into like what's going on here. And I thought that that was a neat way to do it. Even down to like when we, when I did the rewrites at the end, you know, with, with the pool sequence and all that, like there was this whole thing where the book, the book didn't even really matter in the original, original script. It mattered because it would talk about like how to break the curse and stuff, but then they get it, they read it. And that was kind of it. It never tied back into the book. So I brought back the ending to tie it more back into the book to make everything relate back to the book with like feeding the book, you know, and, and making it more about that's how you get rid of like, you know, our Greg Null character in the end. Cause it was never like that before. And it's just like, I believe with the way it was written, if I want to say what it was, I think it was the, the, the dream widow band basically like pounced on top of him after they reappear and they just ripped him. They like ripped his body parts <laughs> apart. And then they all kind of like disappear. And Dave and like the guys were kind of watching this happen, you know, and it was like super graphic, like arms, heads ripping off everything. And they're almost like just animalistic and then they just kind of disappear. But I like what we did now. It's more of like, it's more of like a spiritual, like, Pre-ending, yeah. which I thought yeah, was yeah. Cool for a com- for a, for, a, for a, a, a rock and roll comedy. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching part one of our interview with BJ McDonald. We hope you enjoyed it. You can check out our other episodes, our other guests on all your favorite podcast locations and on YouTube. Search for Tales from the Pit podcast. Remember to like and subscribe. And you can also check out our website at TalesFromThePit.net. We'll see you next time. Bye.